Magna Carta today has become an important symbol of rule of law and democracy. It wasn't intended as a statement of freedom for everybody or democracy for everybody, but gradually over time it was used for certain causes that eventually came on to take that character. Magna Carta became a kind of a, a, a symbol of the rule of law, of constraints on authority. So over time it gradually took on this quality increasingly. This field here is the place where King John, John Lackland, met with the people who had rebelled against him to try and reach some kind of peace agreement based on the demands of the barons who'd rebelled against him that are encapsulated in a document which still survives today called the Articles of the Barons. It wasn't intended to create democracy or the rule of law. Nobody knew what that meant at the time. These are all later developments of, of the concepts that perhaps began here, but it, it wasn't intended to achieve that. It was really a peace deal intended to meet the requirements of certain groups in society, most of whom were themselves part of the social elite. One great 19th century historian, Bishop Stubbs, in 1870, said that you could see the whole of English constitutional history as merely a commentary on Magna Carta. So it is really the foundation of the way we think about liberty, and not just us, but people in America, in the Commonwealth, and really most other liberal democratic states. The significance of Magna Carta is that it says that no one, not even the king, is above the law. And the implication of Magna Carta is that the king is bound by it. And the barons knew that King John was a bit slippery, so they set up a committee to ensure that it was enforced. Now one uh, medieval historian said about it, the king is below God and below the law and that's a fundamental principle of all modern liberal states. Its main influence is that it stands for something that we all understand. You have to go back to the Charter again. There are words like justice and liberties and rights and law of the land and common council of the realm. Uh, these things matter to us. We didn't get trial by jury from Magna Carta, but when the last, in the last government there was a proposal to amend the right to trial by jury to reduce its availability in certain circumstances. Everybody went around saying this is against Magna Carta. It wasn't actually against Magna Carta, but it's a, an example of how Magna Carta resonates with us. When we're looking for something on which to hang the banner of our liberties, our rights, our freedoms, we think Magna Carta. We may be completely wrong. But if that's the perspective we have, and that's the banner that we're prepared to march under, uh, that's why it's significant. We have four charters, 1215, 1216, 1217, 1225. We call them Magna Carta, but they're four and they're different. They were all proclaimed. There was no printing press, there was no television, there was no news night, there was no commentary, uh, there were no newspapers in the morning, and there was certainly no Facebook, Google, and so on. But people knew about it. It was proclaimed. Somebody said to you, uh, the king's got a great new charter. It's going to be shouted in the marketplace in wherever town you came from, city you came from. You go and listen. You think, ooh, that's interesting. We're going to get justice, are we? Oh, that's good. Hmm. Ooh, consent to taxation. That's good. Not sure about the way the church has muscled its way into the first clause. And uh, what about these barons? I mean, who are they? You know, why are we agreeing with them? But the important thing we have to grasp, and it's very difficult for our age to grasp, is that by 1220, before the 1225 charter, we have a baron in Northumberland, not one of the people who was there at Runnymede, relying on the charter. There's a great case in 1226 in Lincolnshire where the, the high sheriff is taken on for not abiding by the terms of the charter of the Lord the King. I mean, this is, our medieval forebears did understand things. And Magna Carta worked its way very quickly into national consciousness. No free man is to be arrested or imprisoned or deceased or outlawed or exiled or in any way destroyed, nor will we go against him, nor will we send against him, save by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. To no one will we deny or delay right or justice.
Well, physically, Magna Carta is written on parchment, which is a specially prepared sheepskin. It's sort of that kind of shape, and then the king's seal authenticates it, the seal of King John. So don't ever say it's signed, it was never signed, it's authenticated by the king's seal. It was issued by King John on the 15th of June 1215, across its 63 chapters. It has a whole series of do's and don'ts. And most important of all, in chapter 39, it said no free man is to be imprisoned, arrested, outlawed, deprived of his property, or in any way proceeded against, save by the lawful judgment of his peers, meant his social equals, or by the law of the land. And that's a fundamental bar against tyrannical rule. It means the king, or any ruler, can't just say, off with your head, into prison, I'm seizing your property. If he wants to act against you, he either has to get a judgment, if you like, a judgment of a jury against you, or go through some other legal process. Now that principle has reverberated down the ages. It seemed very important to the parliamentary opposition to Charles I in the 1640s. It was appealed to by the founding fathers of the American Constitution. In the last century it was cited by Gandhi and Mandela. It's still part of the political debate in Britain today. One of the remarkable things about the Magna Carta project has been the sheer amount of new discoveries connected with it. On the one hand, a very large number of new charters of King John have been discovered in their original form and they're all going to be put onto the project's website with images, full commentary and so on. What we've also been able to show is one of the four originals of the charter was actually sent in 1215 to Canterbury Cathedral. No one's ever known that before and that fits in very very well with this whole idea that yes in 1215 the charter went to the cathedrals not to the sheriffs and it shows how the church played an absolutely key part in preserving and propagating, spreading news about the Charter. I think another major discovery relates to Magna Carta as a British document. It's often thought of as rather sort of Anglo-Saxon, narrow, dealing with immediate grievances just in England. But actually there's a very strong British dimension to Magna Carta. It's got very important chapters about the Welsh, and there's got chapter 59 about the King of Scotland. Now it's in that context that a major new discovery has been made, which is King John's own account of the treaty he forced on the King of Scotland in 1209. No previous text of that treaty has ever been known, now we've discovered it. And what it shows, in quite stunning fashion, is that King John was asserting the King of England over lordship over Scotland. It was making Scotland a subject kingdom. And the effect of Magna Carta and of the whole civil war surrounding it was to deprive King John of the ability to impose the Treaty of 1209. In other words, he could not make Scotland a subject kingdom and thus the effect of Magna Carta is really to preserve Scotland's independence. This year we're celebrating 800 years and venerating the Magna Carta as an important symbol of the rule of law. And this is a great time to remember that it's a great British and English achievement that we've developed a tradition of the rule of law, which has been important as a domestic standard to protect those who are weak, but also it's been an important international standard, both in terms of encouraging human rights and the rule of law internationally, but also as a commitment to our membership of the Council of Europe and the in European Convention on Human Rights. And it's fantastic that during these celebrations, the Magna Carta will be used as a point of entry in debates up and down the country, but especially in schools, to remind children and to introduce a critical discussion of what it means to be British and a discussion of the importance of the rule of law as a part of what it means to live in a British community with all other citizens. But in this 800th year, we should also remember that the Magna Carta has in the past been used as an ethno-nationalist symbol with which to attack some British citizens. My research confirms that there have been periods where the symbol of the Magna Carta has been used not as an inclusive way of including all individuals, all British citizens, for protection by the law, but as an exclusive 
ethno-nationalist symbol that's excluded certain types of religious minorities, such as, for example, Jews. So in this 800th year of the celebration of the Magna Carta, I think it's important to make sure that it's used as a shield to protect those who are powerless and vulnerable, rather than as a stick with which to beat minorities. I think it's very important for us to mark the Magna Carta anniversary, not just because it's a historic event, although that's obviously very important, but because it's still an important document today. All around us we see uh, arguments taking place over the meaning of the values which we're attached to, democracy, human rights, rule of law. We also see in, in different ways those values being, being under attack, either from outside forces or from arguments internally. Present disagreements over what the place of the UK should be within the European Convention on Human Rights often involve both sides of the argument invoking Magna Carta. So people may say opposite things to each other and both claim that they are acting upon the spirit of Magna Carta. So it's very important that we try and understand what Magna Carta is all about and also what it means today as well as what it meant historically.